and welcome to another STP Community Webinar. My name is James and I'm the Event Coordinator here at STP. Today we are joined by Julia Pottinger from Quality Works Consulting and she will be talking about the Agile QA Toolkit, discussing her experience as a QA consultant and the various testing tools and concepts she applied as well as other useful QA tips. A few things to cover before we get started today. A reminder we have an upcoming webinar next week on Wednesday, December 16th from Joel and Cardo at Olo Inc. The topic is scaling quality, and if this sounds intriguing to you, please visit softwaretestpro.com to register for the webinar. SCP is looking to fill the 2021 community webinar schedule, and whether you're new to speaking or have been doing it for years, webinars are great tools to help sharpen your public speaking skills or test out new content you've been working on. So visit softwaretestpro.com and submit your presentation proposal today. If you're on social media and talking about this webinar, be sure to tag us at softwaretestpro and use the hashtag STPWebinar. Also, give Julia a follow while you're at it at AILUJ876. That's Julia backwards. All right, let's go ahead and get started, but quickly, let's do an introduction for everyone here for Julia. Julia is a lead QA consultant with experience creating test automation frameworks in Java, Ruby, and Node.js. Her expertise in manual, automated API testing and training has helped companies significantly enhance the quality of their software through improved test coverage. Fast to fast faster time to market, increased process efficiency, and optimized use of resources. Julia is passionate about her sharing her knowledge and experience and contributes to the testing community through writing articles, delivering testing courses, and conducting testing workshops. And with that, welcome Julia. Uh, we are excited to have you today. Uh, the floor is all yours uh, whenever you're ready. Hi everyone. I hope you're doing well, and I hope that you are staying safe during this time. I want to welcome you again to the Software Testing Professional Community Webinar session on the Agile QA Toolkit. So today we're going to go through a roadmap of how you can create your own toolkit so that you can become an impactful tester. So my name is Julia Pottinger. I has shared um, a lead QA at Quality Works Consulting Group. You can find me over at Twitter at ILH876. Also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Julia Pottinger, where I talk a bit more about testing and development topics like WebDriver, IO, and React if you're interested. I also have a blog, juliapottinger.com, where I share my knowledge as well. And you can check out my test automation university course. It's on WebDriver IO. Today, we're first going to talk about what the qualities of an impactful QA are. Then I'm going to share with you my journey on how I became an impactful QA, as well as what's in my toolkit. Then I'm going to walk you through the suggested roadmap on how you can grow to become an impactful QA. And then together, we're going to create a toolkit. So let's get started. You can think of a toolkit as a personal set of resources, skills, or abilities that you use for a particular purpose. So let's say you're on the road, you're going on a road trip, and you have a flat tire. You would really need a spare tire. You'd have your jack to jack up the car. You'd have the things to remove the lug nuts, all of those. And then you'd remove the tire, put on the spare, tighten it back, and continue on your trip. Similarly, with a QA toolkit, it's going to comprise of all the skills that you would need to address a particular task that you're going to do. So let's say that that task is testing an e-commerce website, for example. Your QA toolkit would comprise of the knowledge of testing, how to understand the requirements for the e-commerce website, how to create bugs if you find any and report those, verify that they are fixed. If you're doing test automation, you would need to have some object-oriented programming, a specific knowledge, a specific framework, etc. That would be your toolkit, what you're going to use to test that e-commerce site. 
Now, an impactful tester, in my definition, is someone that after having that toolkit, they're able to use it to address specific problems. They're able to contribute to the quality of the product. So not only find bugs, but you are able to give direction on what you think would be best in terms of usability of the product, accessibility of the product, and you're able to use the resources in your toolkits as well as your different skill sets to increase process efficiency, the overall quality of the product. As an impactful tester, your toolkit continues to evolve over time. So you will gain some unique knowledge in particular areas. You will learn how to be innovative, how to think quickly about a solution, how to ensure your quality of work is high, remains consistent, because your toolkit is something that you'll always have with you. It's something that you continue to build on. And this results in you being a reliable team player that is able to adapt to all the different scenarios and you apply your toolkit to those different scenarios. In the day-to-day -day life of an impactful QA, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of tasks that you may be required to do. So this varies from writing test cases, executing test cases, or doing some exploratory testing. If you work in an organization that is doing agile, you're also expected to do story estimation, backlog grooming, talk with your developers, attend daily scrum, sprint planning. You also write test automation. And this means that you will need to be knowledgeable about a wide variety of tools, methodologies, and you have to find root cause for bugs that you find. And you also bring fresh ideas. What about us trying this way? The, what if the user is doing this? Is this the expected actions? All of that. That is just some things that an impactful tester does on a daily. Now, that is a lot. And you are expected to know a lot. You're expected to give a lot on a daily. So these are just a few more. You have to do some form of requirement gathering. So requirements may not be clear or proper acceptance criteria may not have been written. So you will need to ask questions to ensure that the developer, the tester, everyone on the team understands the feature that is going to be built. You have to do some form of work to work with your product owner to get the proper business logic. You may need to document that business logic somewhere. You also have to do test planning test case management and test strategy creation. This can be from you creating test cases to having a whole regression suite, etc., or it can be just you planning out exploratory testing that you may have to do. Another thing is that you always have to consider the release quality versus the deadline that you're given. So if it is that you're doing estimations for a project, and you have to release something in a week. You have to look on the task that you're taking in the sprint and consider QA effort. Am I, along with my team members, going to be able to finish testing all of these things on time? There are going to be times when you're going to be faced with the question of, this is very urgent, we have a deadline and it has to go out, but you have to find a way to balance that timeline with the quality of the project. You don't want it to go out and there are a lot of bugs. Another important thing is that after you execute your test cases, you have to do bug reporting and verification. You have to write really good bugs. This is because good bug reports help to reduce the time it's going to take for the developer to fix the issue. If it is that the issue isn't clear, then they're going to come back to you and say, I'm unable to reproduce it. So you need to ensure that your bugs are reproducible and clear. Additionally, you have to, within your workday, do continuous integration. Continuous integration, ensuring that when, once it is that a new feature is built, 
your test automation, it runs, it verifies that there are no adverse effects, no new bugs were found. An impactful tester will also have to do team communication. This is working with developers on new features, regression testing with your team, working with product owners, other members of the team to understand business logic, all of that. Using different tools, methodologies, giving suggestions, bringing fresh ideas and perspectives, and creating and maintaining those automated tests. A lot of times persons talk about creating, men, creating automated tests, but they forget about the maintaining of those tests. Maintaining your automated tests to ensure that they are failing for the right reasons, to ensure that it is still up to date with the changing requirements is very important. So along with the day-to-day -day activities, what skills does an impactful QA have? There is in no way what I just mentioned, an exhaustive list of things that an impactful QA does. They do that plus much more. But in order to do all of those things, there are certain skills and attributes that they need. And I have put those skills into four different categories. The first category is that you have to understand agile like QA processes. Now, these processes include asking important questions. A lot of times I have found that just by asking certain questions, I get a new part of a business logic that I was not aware of. I get a use case that needed to be tested. I find some bug just by asking certain questions. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Questions are needed to be asked because everyone have different perspectives and there are times when that perspective may not have been considered, that use case may not have been considered. I mentioned communicating effectively before so that you work well with your team, you're able to communicate bugs, et cetera. In Agile, you need to know how to properly size a story. You need to do retro, you need to do release management and ensure that you don't let the deadline impact the quality of what it is that you're releasing. So while you have to keep in mind the deadline, you also have to keep in mind the quality and ensure that you have the proper time to test. You also need to be mindful of the seven software testing principles. That is a favorite of mine. So that is a software QA concept where you cannot test everything. Exhaustive testing is really impossible. So you have to know how to pick out scenarios. You have to know how to do boundary value analysis to ensure that the correct things are being tested. So once it is that you have those concepts, you know how to create proper bugs, you know how to do test automation, you know how to create test cases with different data sets. All of those things are important skills for an impactful tester to have. The second category is testing concepts and test execution. I just mentioned the seven testing principles as well. Also exploratory testing. If it is that you're doing exploratory testing, you don't just want to go in without a plan. You want to ensure that you time box yourself, you give yourself a goal. Am I testing a particular feature? Am I doing regression on a particular area? And while it is that you're doing exploratory testing, you want to ensure that you write down any bugs that you may come across. These bugs are going to be important so that once it is you're finished doing exploratory testing, you can write them up and you can get them resolved. Now, understanding how to automate is important, but also understanding what to automate. Are you going to automate all of your regression tests? What if your regression suite is really large? Do you need to automate all of those? So only choose areas that are always run, that are very high traffic. You may automate your smoke test, 
you may also automate things that have a lot of different configurations configurations on different device sizes different browser type different operating systems etc the third category has to do with test automation so i just mentioned that you need to understand what to automate this flows into doing test automation before you can do test automation i would suggest that you understand some object oriented language so that you can create good code i know that there are tools out there that you can do click and play but for me i find them to be a bit restrictive and i personally prefer to write my own test automation from scratch rather than using a plug and play tool because I find this to be more effective. So after we know object oriented programming, we need to learn about locator strategies. We have CSS locators, we have XFAS, we have find by attributes, etc. Having proper locator strategies can be the difference between your test always failing once it is a new release goes out or if your test is not as flaky. So you need to, an impactful tester has the skill of writing proper locators. Creating a test automation strategy is another skill that an impactful tester has, knowing how to figure out the goal of test automation. Who is going to be writing the automation on your team? What are you going to be automating? As I said before, are you going to just be doing smoke tests? Are you going to try and automate all your regression suite? Is that feasible? Is that something that you can do? As well as continuous integration. So there are different tools that you can use. You can use Jenkins, Travis, CircleCI, GitLab. Understanding any one or all of these continuous integration tools, as well as the concept of continuous integration and continuous delivery, is a skill that an impactful tester has. Test data management is important as well. How you generate the data that you're going to be using in your test automation or just for manual testing. So boundary value analysis, knowing that you can't enter all the different inputs, but you have to select particular ones. So test data generation and management, how do you manage the data that your test will use to run? How do you create new data on each run if you're doing test automation? How do you go to different URLs? How do you set up your system to run on production versus QA? If it is that there are QA tests that should not be run on production, all of those are different skills that an impactful tester has. And lastly, there are a variety of other skills. So the list is a bit long, but an impactful tester has a toolkit that they are continuing to build on over time so clean code practices doing performance testing if it is that someone has really poor wi-fi are they able to still use your system how long does it take for pages on your application to load can your system handle two million concurrent users coming to your site at one time all of those things helping to document business logic really important. Doing user acceptance testing, performing API testing, database testing to ensure that data is correct from the unit to the integration to the user interface layer, all the levels are working. So all of that important skills for an impactful tester to have. Now, from all of that, you'll see that QAs do a lot. There is a lot that you do on a day to day. There is a lot of skills that you have. And Stacy Kirk, in her talk on becoming a quality superhero, she spoke about what a tester does. She said that QAs are champions of quality. With all that we do, with the various skills that we have, we have become a champion of the product having a certain quality. We become a champion of quality by being a champion for different things. And these different things include innovation and iterative in improvement of tools. 
we ensure that we have the proper tools to do the work that we do. We are innovative. That is, we create test automation frameworks and we int integrate that into our continuous integration, continuous delivery system. We are the heroes of discipline practices. We have a certain way that we write bugs. So you're going to have your expected results, your actual results, your step to reproduce. You're going to have a proper title for your bugs. That is kind of a format that we use so that our bugs can be easily fixed and easily reproduced. We are transparent. We help everyone to understand the business logic and the features that are going to be implemented. We ensure that the user is considered and we experiment through exploratory testing, trying new data sets, writing different test cases, so that things that aren't immediately considered, we try to think of them and consider them. She mentioned in her talk that some of the villains to all of these things are limited resources, lack of trust by the organization, and having a fear of failure. So those are things to keep in mind that while you're trying to be a champion for quality and innovation and you're passionate and you're experimenting, there may be pushback from your organization on some things that you're suggesting. There may be a fear of failure. What if we try this approach and it doesn't work? But once it is that we're continuing to learn, once it is that we are the heroes of experimenting, we're trying new things, we're being passionate about our work, we're being passionate about quality, then we can be begin to champion these things in our workplaces. She also talked about us being empathetic. When it is that you find a bug and you're telling the developer or you're sharing that there's a bug, they, they may feel a way that they have created a bug or you don't want to play that blame game of who is responsible for the low quality of the product. So you have to be empathetic and understand that how we communicate that message is important. We also need to be able to find root causes. Was the bug here before or did it get in introduced when a new feature came in? Or was it a bug that you saw before and I was like, okay, I did see this bug in the previous build and it has re reappeared. All of those things. So quality, while I'm saying we are champions of quality, it's not just our responsibility. It's the responsibility of everyone in the organization. So it's not just the QA's responsibility for quality, but we are the champions for quality and we partner with other persons on the team, the product so that our acceptance criteria are good. We assist Scrum Masters to get rid of blockers and we champion things like security testing performance testing, accessibility testing, usability testing, all of those things to ensure that they are integrated in the project properly. So with all that said, all the things that QAs do on a daily, all the skills that an impactful tester have, you may be asking, so how do I get there if I'm not already there? Let me walk you through a bit about how I became an impactful tester. I didn't start out here, but this is a bit of where I am at now. I have a toolkit and that comprises of all the things that I mentioned before, being a champion of quality, hero for quality, collaborating with team members, providing fresh ideas and perspectives, having skill sets to do continuous integration, knowing object-oriented programming, queries on database to ensure that the user was actually created, the order was completed, payment was processed, all of that. Using AWS to test lambdas, GraphQL queries, using Jira to write bugs, test rail for test case management, Postman for API testing. But I didn't start here. I had to go and build my toolkit. So, there is a five-step guide that I use to build my QT, my toolkit. Because when I just started doing QA, I didn't know a lot. I was just coming out of university. Well, I was in my third year of university. I hadn't finished university yet. And I knew that my life 
journey was to be a developer. Most persons that I talk to, they don't have an idea that testing was a job. I'm like, I didn't know that testing was something that you do and you get paid for it as a career. I wasn't aware of that. I was just aware that you write code, you're a developer, you build software, software gets shipped. Sure, when I was doing my projects in school, I would test them, ear quotes in test, because I wasn't doing an extensive or a really good job of testing them, but I was checking for certain things. But I had no idea that there was this whole entire career path. So the first thing that I had to do when I started was I had to create a list of objectives. And this list of objectives contained what I wanted to learn. I had to identify what it is I wanted to learn. So that included software testing principles like the seven software testing principles I mentioned before. ISTQB, how to learn, how to test, how to write proper bugs. I didn't know what Agile was. I had to learn how to do Agile, how to point stories, what are the different roles in Agile, how to communicate properly how to do test automation. There's so much that I needed to learn. So it was impossible for me to learn all of this in a week or a month. So I had to set realistic expectations. I'm still learning. I have been doing testing going on six years and I'm still learning. So you have to set small goals as to how it is that you're going to learn certain things. But once it is that you have a certain foundation, learning other things on top of that foundation becomes much more easier, as well as just knowing how to Google. So Google is my best friend. I Google a lot. If I'm unsure about something, I'm going to Google it, see what other persons out there are saying, see what the answers out there are, and then interpret it and apply it to what I'm doing. Now, after creating my list and setting realistic expectations, I had to dedicate time to learn. For me, it was very frustrating because at the time I was working and I was being expected to do QA things, but I didn't really know the QA things that I was supposed to do. So it was really frustrating for me. So I had to dedicate time to learn. Now, some persons are able to learn on the job and do it very well. For me, that is kind of counterproductive because the work that I'm supposed to be doing is something that I don't know, something that I need to learn. So I schedule some time after work. I ask my employer for training time and I learned and I built that foundation. After doing that or while doing that, I use resources and mentors. There are already persons out there in the space that know a lot. They already have built their foundation. They already have their toolkit and they create a lot of resources. A lot of time they do it for free. There are free resources on YouTube. You can pay for classes on Udemy. You have LinkedIn Learning. You also have the amazing Test Automation University by Angie Jones that has a wide variety of free resources that you can learn. Don't try to do everything on your own. Look for the resources that are out there and use them. And then finally, after all of this, I was still working. So I got the opportunity to be on a wide variety of projects. Those projects happen over time. So over the six years that I've been doing QA, I've been on banking applications, e-commerce applications, healthcare, entertainment, travel applications, and all of these applications require a certain foundation, but they also require unique skill sets specific to the business logic of that project. And that is how I have worked on building my toolkit. So when it is that, I built my toolkit to a certain level. I started doing test automation. I first started doing test automation in Java. And in university, I was a Java girl. Everything was better with Java and Java was the way to go. Other persons were doing like C and C sharp, but Java was it for me. Java was the beginning, the end, the middle. 
everything that I did, I did with Java. So starting at CultureWorks, I did my first project in Java. And I was like, this, this isn't so bad. I know Java, I can write some test automation in Java. And then I was told that I needed to write some automated tests in JavaScript. And whew, that was a task for me because JavaScript was so much different at the time than Java. And it was a big challenge for me. Now, what I wrote is on the screen here. That was my very first JavaScript attempt at test automation, and it was very horrible. <laughs> I can say that is mine. It's, it was horrible. I I was trying to do a search feature, and I was you know clicking on some things, waiting for elements to be visible, asserting that it contains some things. As you realize, it was very flaky. Look at my locators they're so long it's like divina 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 nth child and i'm iterating all over the place and i have a long loop and it was just really horrible so every time that there was a new release if they changed a div or added a new div you know my code was going to fail and it would just fail over and over but this is something that i wrote six years ago so from then i have improved but it had no page objects, the locators were horrible, and I really didn't know JavaScript. So what I had to do was I had to go out and learn JavaScript. At the time, I was using Code School to learn Node.js, and they had this really nice song that I loved. And when you started the tutorial, the song would come in and I'd be dancing, and it got me really hyped to learn Node.js. It's, I'm going to play the song and I want you to listen to it. It may get you hyped, it may get you interested in learning Node.js if that's not a language in your toolkit. But I remember it being a memorable experience for me learning where, so that even now I still remember the song. And coming from that horrible test code that I wrote, I'm now able to have a course on Test Automation University I'm able to have a YouTube channel that I teach people about test automation in JavaScript. So in order for, to get here, I had to build my foundation. And this song, this process of learning Node.js was one of that. So listen to the song. Let me know if you get a vibe, if it is that it gets you pumped or anything like that. You're on my application starting to fail. It's crawling on the network just as fast as a snail. We need invented programming starting from the top. Better write some code so the world doesn't stop. With the non-blocking model, we will be just fine. Built on Google Chrome's V8 runtime. And all you need to do is write some JavaScript code and use the real-time web with Node. So that was the song. And for me, I found it really catchy and really interesting. And it got me in the vibe to learn something that I didn't know. So my roadmap was this. This is the roadmap that I used to learn and everything. I, as I said before, I was starting out with Java, but I use Java with Maven, TestNG, all of those awesome things. And then I moved into JavaScript and I had to spend some time learning Node.js, learning JavaScript as I needed to build that foundation. I initially started out using Nightwatch.js and the Nightwatch.js was what I wrote, that code that I just showed you in. That was my very first attempt at it. And then even eventually switched over to WebDriver IO. And WebDriver IO is now my favorite test automation JavaScript framework. And I love it. I've also doubled a bit in CodeCept.js. That's another J JavaScript test automation tool. I've also done some automation in Ruby. And now currently I'm doing a bit in Python. But WebDriver IO JavaScript will always be my love. I also got ISTQB for certified in the foundation and agile level. And that taught me about boundary value analysis, the seven testing principles that I really love. 
And all of these things were new to me at the time. So this was me building my foundation, learning certain things. I had to go on my own journey of going on different projects. Blaze Meter at the time had webinars. Sauce Labs had webinars that were all free that I could go and learn from the thought leaders that were out there at the time to build on my skill because I really didn't know anything. I didn't know much about testing. And I created a map of how I was going to go and get that knowledge. What did I need to learn first? What would I learn next? So I also blog. I wrote an article on mobile testing five years ago. And that gave me a different mindset because I had to research certain things on how to do mobile testing properly. So it gave me more knowledge because I spent time researching and I have it written down. So for me, I find blogging to be really helpful. If it, even if you don't put it out for other persons to see and critique, having the option to go back and look at work that you have done really helps. There's a lot of times when I forget how to do certain things and I have to be like, oh, okay, how do I do this again? And then I go back to something that I have written and it helps me to do that. And it's a way of contributing to the community and it helps you become familiar with work that you have done before. So how do you build your QA cool kits? I've spoken about all the different things that you need to have, the skills and the things that you do on a daily, but how do you actually do it? The same path or journey that I took, these are the same five steps that I'm going to give you along with some additional things. First, you need to create a list of objectives. You need to identify what it is you have in your toolkit. Only you know what you know. So what do you have in your toolkit? And where are the gaps? What exactly are you trying to learn? And I'm going to walk you through a 12 point list of things that you can learn and add to your toolkit. So if you're unsure about what it is that you want to learn, that's fine. And this five point and 12 pointer that will come later on, it's applicable whether or not you're just creating your own toolkit or if you're a manager and you're helping someone else to create their toolkit or if you have a toolkit already and you're just trying to fill in some gaps. Whatever it is that you want to do, you can apply these steps to learning and improving on your toolkit to becoming an impactful tester. So identify what your objective is, what it is that you want to learn, and then set realistic expectations. I'll show you SMART goals. SMART goals, really important as they help you to set expectations that are time bound and very specific. So set your expectations to know you can't learn everything. It will take some time to learn. You need to dedicate some time to learn as well. So you have your list of what you want to learn. You're, you've identified how long it's going to take you to learn. Now you need to set that time to learn. So continuous learning is very important and I encourage companies, if it is that you have persons that need to be trained, you give them some time to train. It may be difficult, but try to carve out some time either given from your company or on your own to learn. Also, use resources and mentors. I find the testing community to be really embracing they're really kind they're really nice there are persons on twitter that tweet out advice persons on linkedin there are a lot of conferences that are online now during this covid time there are sites such as guru 99 udemy linkedin plural site youtube there are so many resources out there that you can use and mentors that you can use to learn so after doing all of that here are the things that I think should be in your QA toolkit and they are listed in order. So as a foundation, you need to learn and understand testing concepts. Without these testing concepts, then you won't be an effective tester. You need to know how to be an effective tester, how to think 
like a user, how to think of certain scenarios, how to understand that the presence, the absence of defects because you don't have any bugs in no way means that the software is 100% bug free. You can start with ISTQB Foundation or their Agile certifications, or you can do some equivalent of that. But if it is that you don't have the money to get this certification, the syllabus and the study material is free, so you can spend some time reading through it and it can still be valuable to you. As I mentioned, Udemy, LinkedIn Learning, YouTube has courses on manual testing, Guru 99. So if it, if it is that you aren't going the ISTQB route or some equivalent of that, find some other way to learn about manual testing, how to create proper test cases and bugs, the concepts of manual testing, what it is you should be looking for when you're testing, the tester's mindset, and especially how testing falls into the different software development lifecycle models. How does it work in Agile? How does it work in Waterfall, where in Waterfall you are at the end of the cycle and everything has been developed before you get it, versus Agile, where it is that you are doing shorter feedback loops and you are more integrated into the process. The third thing is you need to learn about test case creation. Test cases, I've seen horrible test cases where persons are coming onto the project and they're following the test cases and they are lost because the test case is more like a workflow it, and it doesn't give you proper steps to execute your test cases. So knowing how to create proper test cases are important. Knowing how to have different data, set, data sets so that you just aren't continuously testing one thing so that you can find different use cases, different scenarios and find different bugs are really important. Having a proper plan. Now plans can be for manual testing or plans can be for automated testing, but regardless of the plan or the strategy that you're creating, knowing how to do it and do it well is important. Knowing how to do time estimates for your plan. So we're going to be testing a specific feature. How long do you think it would take for you to test that specific feature? Learn how to do that, as well as learn how to properly execute a test, how to do exploratory testing, as I said before, time boxing, looking for certain things, and then learning how to find bugs, how to find the root causes for bugs, how to properly report those bugs so that they can be fixed. And when it is that you're testing, sometimes you may have seen bugs before. So knowing how to add that into your bug report, how we, knowing how to do proper screenshots. So you only screenshot the area that the bug is. You don't do unnecessary multiple screenshots that is going to confuse the person reviewing the bug. The fifth one is after you've learned all those testing concepts and you know, understand Agile, you know how testing falls in the software development life cycle, you want to focus on doing some test automation. So you want to learn about object-oriented programming. Learning a programming language specific to an object-oriented one, you're going to learn about encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance, polymorphism. These are things that you can research and they will help you writing your test automation. So that once it is that you get errors in your code, you're able to properly read the error message understand the error and fix it. So after you're comfortable writing code in a specific language and you can understand certain concepts, then you need to pick a specific framework. So if it is that you're doing Java, then you'll need to know Selenium with Java. If it is that you're doing JavaScript, there are a wide variety of test automation frameworks that you can use like Cypress, with driver IO, Protractor. So you need to identify the language that you want to learn and pick the framework. Angie Jones also has an article on 10 portfolio projects for aspiring automation engineers that you can look at. 
and this is going to be a really good guide for you so you will know what areas to focus on now that portfolio you want to have web and mobile automation because those are two very sought after things especially web automation and you want to do full scenarios so not just a login test but you want to have multiple pages you want to have long scenarios in different frameworks and languages to showcase your skills and your knowledge once it is that you understand all of that you also want to know api testing api testing is becoming really popular and it's a thing that a lot of persons and companies would want you to have so in your toolkit i would suggest that you know how to do api testing and even add in some api automation to your portfolio now the final four are after you have done that so you have a solid foundation of testing manual testing you have a solid foundation with a portfolio of how to do test automation there are some other things apart from that that you should learn like sql databases creating queries that you can use in your test automation this is really important as well no you can also do performance testing performance testing you can do with jmeter blaze meter as well there are other tools that you can do and understanding your role in the quality of the product and this is a hands-on thing this is something that you'll get from being on different projects all of that it will may take you a while to find out exactly where you fit and this may change from team to team but once it is that you have from one to ten the the foundations the solid skills in your toolkit then 11 won't be as hard and it will come a bit easy to you now once it is that you have one to 11 you're going to be more confident more innovative you're going to be able to think of different solutions so all of those things will be in your toolkit so if you have suggestions speak on them and implement those suggestions now 12 things in addition to all i mentioned is a lot a lot of things to do a lot of things to know a lot of things to accomplish and you may be wondering how am i going to do all of that as i said before in the five point of create smart goals so smart goals specific it talks about a specific thing you want achieved as you look on the goal you're able to identify what it is it's measurable so what evidence are you going to have to prove that you have completed that goal so it can be a certification it can be your portfolio of things and once it is that you have completed this goal you are able to re-evaluate re re based on if you got that measurable thing if you need more time or if you need to adjust the goal so your goal should be attainable it should be realistic and it should be able to be achieved within a specific time and your goal should match what it is you're trying to achieve, your core values. So if it is that you're looking to expand your toolkit, then what it is that you're learning should match back to that. And there should be some time that you have set. So I have a quick example here. So my specific goal, it is a bit big, but you can make it a bit smaller. So I want to complete the test automation web UI JavaScript learning path. And it is measurable because on Test Automation University, you get a certificate for course completion. And I know that it's achievable because I had spent two days and I had completed the WebDriver IO portion of it. So, given that and the time that is there for the others, I think that I can complete it in two months. And it's relevant because I'm trying to expand my toolkit to learn JavaScript, do WebDriver, IO, Cypress, and all of that is included in the course. Now, with all of that, you may still be daunted because I admit it's a lot. It's a lot to know, it's a lot to think about, but 
here's something, and this is a Dominican proverb, and it goes one one cocoa full basket. So that is one one cocoa full basket, and it means that you cannot expect success overnight. You cannot expect to complete everything at once. Success and achieving things takes time. You can't know everything. I don't know everything. And it took me, and it's going to take you some time to learn. So one, one cocoa, full basket. Your cocos are the small things, whether it's learning JavaScript, learning ICQB concepts, and those are going to be put into your basket, into your toolkit. Another one is every mickle make a muckle. And this is a favorite one of mine. So it goes every mickle make a muckle. And this just means that small things, when combined one by one, they can have a very big effect. So you're going to combine learning testing concepts, how to create test cases, all of that. And those are going to be your mickles and it's going to come together into one big muckle. So you can think of it as the saying every the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. You just have to start. And once it is that you start, then it becomes easier. As well as, very importantly, you have to celebrate your wins. It can be demotivating when to, once it is that you have a long list of things that you want to achieve. It's taking time. But every small thing that you do, you need to celebrate your win. You need to acknowledge that what you're doing is great. It's important. It, you took effort and it deserves to be celebrated. So whatever way you celebrate, you need to do so. And finally, we're almost finished. How does doing all of this help you? How does improving your toolkit help you? The first thing is that if you're working for somewhere, it positions you for a promotion. If it is that you're not working, it positions you to be knowledgeable to get a job. Now, what I did in order to be promoted, I created a career plan along with my manager on the things that I wanted to learn. So when I started, as I said, I was just in my third year of university. I didn't know about testing, any of that. So I had to create my roadmap, share my roadmap with my manager to say, these are the things that I want to learn and look at the organizational chart of the company that I'm at to see what are the different skills that is going to get me a promotion. And once it is that you highlight those things that you're going to be adding to your toolkit, you create your SMART goals or deliverables around them so that you can move up from a level one to a level two to a senior. And once you have a more complete toolkit, then all of this will fall in line. I There is this, one-on-one -on -one talk that if it is you're having trouble speaking with your manager you can look at it this is by julia evans and you can find her on twitter and it says what to talk about in one-on-ones i find this to be really useful and i currently use this with persons that i lead so i ask them to come prepared to talk about what's going well what's not going well how do they fit in what are the team priorities and how does that affect them and their career journey, where they want to go. Talk about promotions, how can I get, help you get promoted? So in your one-on-one -on -one with your manager, talk about what's been going well, ask for feedback. Feedback needs to be specific and measurable, and also give feedback. Where are you struggling? Because more than likely your manager will have some knowledge and they could possibly be your mentor. They can help you to get promoted, they can help you to build on your toolkit. And most importantly, within these sessions, advocate for yourself. A lot of times, persons may have your best interest at art, but they are busy with other things, or they may not have your best interest at heart. So you need to be the one to advocate for yourself, show how you're growing, show how you're adding things to your toolkit. And with this new toolkit, you're going to be more empowered to speak out, and ask for what you deserve. Then after having your toolkits, it's going to help you to be more confident, as I said. You're going to be more knowledgeable. You're going to know foundations. You're going to be able to do test automation, performance testing. And with this portfolio that you're going to create, you're going to have a portfolio to impress if it is that you're looking for a new job 
you'll have that resume, you'll have that experience. And the last two that are very important, you're going to become a champion of quality. You're going to ensure that the product is of a high quality, it's secure, it's accessible, it's user-friendly, it's verified and validated. And you will make an impact. You'll be an impactful tester with this awesome toolkit that you have. So with all these amazing things in your toolkit, you'll definitely make an impact, you'll shine, you'll be awesome. I believe that you can do it. You need to believe in yourself, advocate for yourself. So with all of these amazing things in your toolkit and this wealth of information, go for it and make an impact. Thank you so much for joining me today. Let me know if you have any questions. I hope that you have been inspired and motivated and you have an idea on how to start to create your own roadmap, start your own journey on improving and adding your toolkit. Let's stay connected. You can find me on the socials on the screen. And if you're interested in working with me or call to work, you can send an email to jpottinger at calltoworkcg.com. Awesome, that was great, Julia. That was very, very insightful. Thank you so much. Um, we do have some questions uh, if you are ready. Sure. All right, first question. What are your thoughts on continuous integration? How do you implement, how do you implement in your team and what are the examples, if you can explain, you did in your team? Okay, so continuous integration for me is very important. It's, it, it includes your test automation that you have created. So before it is that a developer creates a new feature or if it is that a release is going out, it is going to run those automated tests against that new build. So they are going to check it. It's, the automated test is going to be checking for certain things. If it is that those things fail, then that new feature or build won't get released. And then you can go in and do manual checks to see what caused the failure. Sometimes it may be that there is a bug that would have been introduced. So your automated test within that continuous integration pipeline would have found that. So then you can go in, do your checks and say, okay, this bug exists, you manually verify it, and then that release would not have gone out or that build would not have come over to QA. It would then go back to the developer for the developer to fix it. On my projects, I have used GitLab to implement that. There is also Jenkins that you can use as well. So you need to work within, work with your developers to get that integrated if it is that you do not have enough knowledge about it. You can work with them to get their unit test as well. So unit tests written by developers should pass before it is that a release build is created. Perfect, great answer. Um, next question. Can you please share your idea about test planning in Agile and how much it is different from waterfall model? Sure. So waterfall model is going to be much more because with waterfall, you need to plan for the entirety of the project. It, it's going to be a very big, maybe hundreds of pages document. With Agile, I have created test plans that are maybe one or two pages. And it's just high level. It talks about the different features that you're going to test. And it's something that is continuously worked on. So while with Waterfall, you're only going to get the project at the end. So you need to have the plan for everything because you're going to be testing everything. With Agile, you're getting them release by release. So you can have a test plan per, per release. So it's going to be really much smaller, more detailed and specific to what it is that you're testing now. And it also gives you the option of being able to make tweaks. So if it is that a feature is, re is removed from the release for this two week sprint, you can remove that from your test plan and adding something else it gives you that room for flexibility. Great. All right, perfect. Uh, next question. What's the best language to learn for test automation for roadmap number five? 
Okay. I love JavaScript, so I may be a bit biased to that. But I Java is still very popular. There is based on so Angie Jones also did this list of languages that are being used, and Java was the top one. So you can look at Java, but I am biased towards JavaScript. Got it. Makes sense. Um, next question. What is the name of the Automation Academy? So Test Automation University. Okay, yeah, I think he was just clarifying. And then uh, where do you go to find conferences online? There is, there, I'm forgetting the name of it now, but there is this great newsletter by Chris Kent, I think his name is, and he sends out weekly or monthly newsletters on conferences that are going out as well as so you, you can just find him on linkedin or twitter and he normally mentions it he talks about the, the conferences that are happening that are upcoming the cost of them if they're free if you can speak at them so it's a really good newsletter that you can follow um the name of it is slipping me now but chris kent is the one that compiles it all right next question what is your approach to testing separate features versus the fully integrated feature slash product? Do you dedicate more resources to one over the other? So regression testing generally takes a lot more time, in my opinion, than feature testing. So I would dedicate more resources towards regression testing. Feature testing normally on the projects that I'm working on a single person takes a feature and then once it is that those features have been validated then everyone comes together and do regression testing okay next question any tips on how to introduce a culture of testing at an organization so it starts with a conversation you have to have your points prepared why should they invest in testing because it's an investment you're going to need resources, you're going to need time, all of that. So have your points ready as to why it is testing should be implemented in the organization. What are the benefits? Is it that more bugs are going to be found? And what does that mean? Is the, does that mean that the quality of the product has improved? Does that mean that you'll have less customer complaint? And you can bring up facts like they're going to save money, but because if once it is that QA is in the process from the start, they find more bugs from the requirements, which is going to res result in less bugs going to production and then having to come back and be fixed. So you have to put together your points first, arrange meetings with the stakeholders. You have to get that buy-in from the managers off and the directors off because ultimately they are the one that are going to provide the QA resources and talk with the project managers and the developers to get testing integrated. But put together your points first and then have that conversation on how it can benefit the company. Perfect, great answer. A um, couple more questions. For an e-commerce project done with Kinet, uh, Kentico, it has SSO and subdomain, which which is the best way to test it? Can you repeat that? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's written a little difficult. For an e-commerce project done with uh, Kentico, it has SSO and subdomain, which is the best way to test it? Um, so I am assuming Kentico is maybe a CMS or some framework that it was written in. And it has subdomains. Are those subdom I'm not sure what those subdomains are. Are they like QA versus production? If it is that the case, then you know that there are certain tests that you don't want to run on production. So you can add tags to your test to indicate which subdomain they should run on. And then in the command line, when you're running your automated test based on the environment or the subdomain that you're in, you can call those tags so that only tags of that specific subdomain runs when you want it to run. The question was a bit hard to follow, so hopefully that answers what you're looking for. No, I think you did a great job. That was a good, 
good answer. Um, last question, how do you run effective exploratory testing without any requirements? Okay, most, well, a lot of times, depending on what you're testing, you may have some familiarity with it. So you, everyone has to log into some page. If it's an e-commerce, you have purchased something before. So unless the application is really novel, you would have in your mind some idea of what you would want it to do. Also, users, a lot of time it is that they're just starting to use an app, especially if it's new. Like for example, my first time using Instagram or Twitter, I was kind of doing exploratory testing because I have never used Instagram or Twitter before. In that same way, when I'm using the product, there are just things that are going to jump out at you. There are things that you're going to say, it shouldn't work this way, or as a user, this would annoy me. As a user, I would like to have this in. So once it is you have that tester mindset thinking like a user, then even if you don't have requirements, there's always going to be certain things that you are looking for in terms of usability, how it is that thing connect, thing like the login button is always under the email and the password field. What if you have it before it? That is not something that is commonly out there in the world. So all your life experience of using applications before, you can apply that when being a tester while testing but always remember to time box yourself. So you can do a quick run through of the application since you may not be familiar or there are no requirements. And you can start to document requirements and bring them to the project owner and other business analysts as well. So while going through the application, you yourself can be that person to initiate the creation of requirements so that everyone has an understanding of where the project will be going. Great, that was an awesome presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Julia, we enjoyed having you and uh, hopefully when we get back to in-person conferences, we'll, uh, we'll see you at STPCon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the day and stay safe. Thank you. All right, everyone, that concludes our webinar for today. Thanks again, Julia. And just a couple reminders before we leave here, our next webinar will take place next Wednesday on December 16th at noon Eastern. Uh, Joa Ellen Carter will be giving a presentation on scaling quality, so visit softwaretestpro.com if you want to sign up for this webinar. And if you'd like to be considered for a webinar presentation or have an idea for a great testing topic, uh, please visit softwaretestpro.com and submit your proposal. Thank you again, Julia, and everyone who attended the webinar today. Please have a great day, stay safe, and we will see everyone next week.